I think we're all aware of the tragedy unfolding in Syria. We see it every night on the television. Accounts of what is happening has been confirmed by organizations like Amnesty. And those accounts are, are truly horrific. It's a bit of a puzzlement though, because ever since 2000, we've had in existence what is known as a doctrine of the responsibility to protect. It's been hailed in some circles as a brave new norm in international relations. Um, and many people are wondering why the thing does not apply to Syria, because Syria would appear to be um, tailor-made for the application of this brave new doctrine. After all, what the doctrine says is that if that states have a responsibility to protect to protect the uh, human rights of their citizens. And if they're unable or unwilling to do so, the international community as a whole has a responsibility to go in and do the job in different ways, even if this, at the last resort, requires the use of force. Uh, and we know that this principle was what was appealed to just a year ago when it was decided to intervene in, uh, in uh, Libya. So the question is, why can't something be done now? And uh, this, is, this is the demand that's sort of going up all around the world. Why can't something be done? Now to answer that question, I think we need to go back and look at what is known as humanitarian intervention. And when I talk about humanitarian intervention, I'm talking about um, one of the most important developments in international relations in the last uh, 25 <coughs> or 30 years. It is simply the idea that um, of intervention in the domestic affairs of a sovereign state in order to protect the human rights of individual citizens in that state. Uh, as I say, it's an important new idea and practice. It's got a lot to do with the fact that ever since World War II there has been an ongoing human rights movement. And in a, and in, and in a sense, uh, the idea or doctrine of a responsibility to protect is the final working out, or perhaps not the final, but a working out of that process along with things like uh, the international criminal court, uh, for instance. It's got a lot to do with that, but the idea of a responsibility to protect also has a lot to do with what is called the CNN factor. That is a reference to the way in which global media present us with images of things that are happening in different parts of the world that are more dramatic and more immediate uh, than was the case in the past and that these images create demands for, quote, something to be done to stop the carnage and the slaughter in, in different countries. And there have been a lot of examples of this. I haven't the time to quote them all, but just give you a, a sampling to perhaps refresh your memories. Uh, in Iraq in 1991, there was the introduction uh, at the end of the first Gulf War of what were called no-fly zones which were attempts to protect the Shiites in the south and the Kurds in the north from, from uh, Saddam's uh, government. There was intervention first by the United States and then by um, the UN in Somalia in 1992 um, and 93. There were famous interventions in the former Yugoslavia, first of all in, um, in Bosnia and then in 1999 in Kosovo. And then, of course, there was the intervention in Timor, the one Australia was involved in, in 1999, and a large uh, intervention authorised by the UN in Darfur, which is a province of the Sudan, in 2007. There have been others, but that's perhaps uh, a good sample of what it is I'm talking about. It's a practice that has 
caught on. So much so that people would argue that uh, intervention for humanitarian purposes is becoming a new norm in international relations. The problem is that it's been shot through with difficulties. It is at the very least a problematic notion. For instance, it was always inconsistently applied. You had intervention in Timor, but not in Rwanda, when 800 odd thousand people were slaughtered in a civil war there. There's been a lack of clarity about uh, the grounds for intervention. There have been arguments about what the right authority for um, endorsing <coughs> intervention uh, is. Should it be the Security Council? And what happens if you can't get agreement on the Security Council? Uh, there are arguments about the, the mandates that have been given to interveners in the past. And sometimes they leave a lot to be asked for. Remember the plight of the Dutch peacekeepers who stood around while the slaughter took place in Srebrenica uh, in Bosnia. And that, was a lot to, that had a lot to do with the, the rather unclear character of the, the mandate. Uh, but underlying it all, of course, is the problem of sovereignty. Because intervention in the domestic affairs of a sovereign state flies in the face of the principle of sovereignty which rightly or wrongly is regarded as the bedrock of international order. And the responsibility to protect doctrine was very much an attempt to get around this sovereignty problem. It was an initiative that was inspired by Kofi Annan, a former Secretary General of the UN, who was picked up by what was called the International Commission on um, Intervention and State Sovereignty, uh, which was jointly chaired, um, one of the chairs was Gareth Evans, the former Australian Foreign Minister, and it eventually found um, uh, fruition in a, a motion of the General Assembly and it was endorsed by the Security Council. What it does is do three things. First of all, it says it defines sovereignty as responsibility. And this, of course, is the crux of the thing. It's an attempt to get around the difficulties imposed by the idea of sovereignty. States are responsible for protecting the human rights of their citizens. That's their primary responsibility. It also designates <coughs> the alleged abuses. It says that states should protect their citizens against genocide, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity and war crimes. It's very specific. Um, and thirdly, it reaffirms the role of the UN Security Council as the right authority for endorsing uh, intervention. So it has all those three things. And in a way, uh, you could be persuaded in thinking that because it has these three things, three things, it gets around the problems that I alluded to with regards to humanitarian intervention. But in a way, the problems haven't been solved. Um, whether or not we have a new norm depends a lot, for instance, on the legal status of the responsibility to protect. And Emily, of course, will pick up on this in a moment. But apart from the legal problems, I think there remain serious ethical and political problems as well. Uh, and if you're not persuaded of this, just reflect on the fact that the one occasion on which a responsibility to protect was appealed to as justifying intervention, and that was in the case of Libya, on the Security Council, there were five abstentions the motion wasn't opposed, but five countries abstained. And they were China, India, Russia, Germany, and Brazil. Pretty big hitters in the international community at the moment. So if you want some evidence about um, the suspect nature of this, uh, that might be one indicator. I mentioned the ethical objections. Uh, I'm referring here to what you might call ethical... Um, uh, is intervention ethically legitimate? Some people would say no. Some people would say that 
ideas of a universalist, liberal, or cosmopolitan character um, are opposed very much, uh, or they want to oppose them very much. They say that what matters most in the world is community. All legitimacy resides at the local level. People derive their well-being and their identity uh, from the fact that they are members of particular communities and cultures, and nothing should be done to damage that. And anything that suggests that the local is being challenged by some uh, disembodied principle of universalism um, is, is suspect. Uh, you might say, well, in the globalised world, surely we're moving more in the direction of universalism. In some respects, we are. But it's characteristic of our age that there are contradictory tendencies, one of which is globalisation, but the other of which is fragmentation. And people who hang on to the community idea are very much giving expression to the fragmentation dimension of what's happening in the world at the moment. And then there are the political objections. Um, at the very centre is the issue of interests. It just would seem doubtful that states will support intervention. Um, doubtful if they'll support it if it's not in their interests. Russia and China do not consider intervention in um, Syria at the moment uh, to be in their interests. Uh, other countries in the past have also base their attitude to this sort of thing on how they see uh, their interests. Uh, the other thing about the political problem is that the Security Council has been reaffirmed as um, the authorising body and yet that appears to be where the real problem resides at the moment because two permanent members, each of whom have the veto, uh, are standing in the way of any further uh, progress in this area. The other thing about the political is that in many parts of the world, in most parts of the world, the idea of intervening, the idea of sending your military personnel halfway across the world uh, to look after the human rights of some uh, other group of people is not particularly popular. Look what happened in Somalia in 1992-93. Once 18 American Marines died in Mogadishu, in a gunfight, um, Clinton pulled those American forces out almost overnight. Clinton also made it clear at the beginning of the, U uh, the NATO operation against um, uh, Milosevic to protect the Albanians in Kosovo that under no circumstances would ground troops be used. And of course, most people who studied the issue knew that you couldn't solve the problem uh, without the use of, of ground troops. And you might also ask yourself, what might have been the reaction in Australia had, as a consequence of our intervention in Timor, we may have lost uh, military personnel? I suspect that the widespread political support for that issue might have very, very quickly ebbed away. It's no, it, there is a, defi a democratic deficit problem uh, with all of this. And finally, the other thing about the political dimensions is the uncertainty attaching to how an intervention is going to work out. It's something that all governments have to take account of, even if they want to ignore what the electorate thinks. They've still got to try and make some assessment as to where all this is going. And it's very murky territory. You might say, for instance, that at the moment we don't know what on earth is going to happen in Syria. At the moment, it's looking very much like a civil war. Is a civil war situation the same as the sort of thing that's outlined in a responsibility to protect? Or rather, is it the sort of thing that uh, you should be very wary about uh, getting involved in? And then there's a the whole question of what happens after the intervention. In most cases, in order to put right the situation that produced the, the danger in the first place, you have to rebuild infrastructure. And that means that the intervene, interveners are looking at a very, very long-term project. I gave a talk like this once in Indonesia 
at the Indonesian Naval Staff College and they said to me, well look, um, Timor used to be our problem, now it's yours. It was a rather cynical sort of uh, uh, initiative, but I could see what they were getting at and I suspect that uh, most states have to think about uh, the long term. So I guess all I'm suggesting is that there are very, very deeply rooted political and ethical problems with all of this, that those problems existed prior to a responsibility to protect, and I don't believe that the new doctrine has uh, resolved them. Now, in March of last year, Gareth Evans said, quote, the whole point of the responsibility to protect doctrine is simply to generate a reflex international response that occurring or imminent mass atrocities are everybody's business, um, not nobody's. It's a fair step back, I think, from what the aspirations for the doctrine were uh, right at the start. Um, the idea of an, a, ref, a reflex response to horrors that are happening in other parts of the world is probably in advance. Uh, but it still doesn't look like a norm. Um, and for that reason, I don't think it'll have uh, much impact at the moment. The fact is that military intervention of the sort that some people seem to be demanding now with regards uh, to Syria is still very, very serious business. And most states will treat each case in a fairly ad hoc way. A responsibility to protect may become a norm. In other words, the sentiment may become so generally accepted around the world that countries will see it in their interests as supporting it, if only to be seen as, quote, a good international citizens. Uh, but I think we're a long way from that, regrettably. Thank you. Uh, I'll be talking to you about responsibility to protect from a bit of a, a legal perspective. Um, however, I'm likely going to end up covering quite a lot of similar material to Dr. Howard simply because anyone who's ever studied international law uh, can often find it indistinguishable from international relations and, uh, and politics. Um, to understand really the kind of the, the legal construction of, of, I'm going to call it R2P to make it easier, and its limitations, you do really need to understand the international legal system, specifically the international law on the use of force. Uh, I'm also going to, to start with a bit of a history lesson. The, the modern international legal system as we understand it today can really trace its origin back um, to the 1648 Peace of Westphalia, uh, which were actually two peace treaties that ended the Thirty Years' War in Germany and the Eighty Years' War between Spain and the Netherlands. And the treaties came about as a result of what we would understand now as being a diplomatic conference. And it was these were basically convened as a way of trying to deal with the issue that nation states in the Middle Ages dealt with one another fairly regularly through the means of warfare. And religious wars, specifically between Catholic and Reformation powers, were fairly commonplace. What the Peace of Westphalia attempted to do was to introduce concepts into the international relations and international legal system uh, to basically say that nation states had a right to territorial integrity that a state had authority over uh, its, its territorial borders and its people living within those territorial borders uh, and that such authority needed to be acknowledged and respected regardless of whatever internal political, social, cultural structures uh, existed in the state. And connected to this idea of territorial integrity was the idea of non-intervention. Uh, basically, the idea was that no nation state was entitled to interfere in the domestic affairs of another state. So you shouldn't go to war with your neighbour because you disagree with their religion. So this was enshrined in the international legal system as being the way states should, should deal with one another. And it was bolstered in 1815 with the Congress of Vienna, which was a meeting of, of European diplomats. And while they didn't necessarily come up with any new concepts in the same way that the Peace of Westphalia did, what the Congress of Vienna did was enshrined this Eurocentric view of international law and basically kind of spread it throughout the world. So this is when people talk about international law being Eurocentric, this is essentially what they're referring to. But if we're looking at the law on the use of force, you really want to go to the kind of foundation document of international law as we know it now, and that's of course the UN Charter. And it really sets up the relevant rules. It was, as we should all know, it was uh, adopted at the end of the Second World War. 
and enshrined this Westphalian idea of, of the sovereignty and independence of states. And it says under Article 2.1, the organisation is based on the principle of sovereign equality of all its members. And it goes on to affirm the principle of non-intervention in Article 2.4. And this is the one that gets talked about all the time. All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Now, this is not an absolute principle. There are, are some, set, uh, some limited exceptions where the use of force is going to be permissible. Uh, specifically under Article 51 of the UN Charter, it says it's provided that nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defence if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. So it stresses really that there is a right to use force as an exception provided that there has been an armed attack. So some kind of use of armed force by one state against another. In addition, the UN Security Council is entitled to authorise collective action. This is contained in Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. It's when they talk about Chapter 7 powers, this is what they're referring to. Uh, under Chapter 7, the Security Council is responsible for taking whatever action it deems necessary in response to threats to the peace, breaches of the peace, and acts of aggression. And under Article 39, the Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, and shall make recommendations or decide what measures are to be taken in accordance with Article 41 and 42 to maintain or restore international peace or security. And under Chapter 7, the Charter is entitled to authorise member states to use any necessary means, including force, in response to any situation that they deem to be a threat to international peace and security. Now, with this background in mind, there is no, it needs to be understood that there is no international legal right or duty to intervene for humanitarian grounds. It's only when there has been an act of armed force by one state against another. Humanitarian intervention is still considered an illegal interference in the internal affairs of a sovereign state. And historically, in most instances of what people have tended to look at as being humanitarian intervention, for instance, with regards to places like Bangladesh, or perhaps with uh, some people look at the uh, Vietnamese involvement um, in, um, pardon me, in Kampuchea, Cambodia, as being uh, really, it's, they've been justified in terms of being um, a response to a threat to international peace and security. Um, what Bob referred to earlier, um, and what you also need to know is now kind of putting pressures on the system, has been the rise of, of international human rights law. Uh, which really has been putting a lot of pressure on this principle of non-intervention. Um, human rights law is actually a comparatively new area of international law. It emerged at the same time as the UN Charter in the post-World War II era and was really shaped uh, in large part by the events of the Second World War. You start to see a lot of treaties being adopted. There was a convention about the prohibition of genocide. There was the, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There have been uh, treaties on uh, gender and uh, racial discrimination. Uh, on uh, refugees, protection of children, and so on. And the UN Charter itself does acknowledge that one of its fundamental um, objects is the protection of human rights. They, they state in Article 1.3 uh, that it is a purpose of the UN to promote and encourage respect for human rights and for fundamental freedom, freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. So what you really have are these two principles that are kind of um, pushing up against one another. On one side, you've got the idea that states are these paramount, inviolable units of international law. They're not to be subject to the will of any other state or any other organisation, and that they have full discretion with regards to how they are going to structure their internal political and social uh, systems. And on the other hand, you have this also developing, and, and some would even argue equivalently strong area of law, which says states don't actually have carte blanche to uh, deal with their people in whatever manner they see fit, and that there are fundamental uh, human rights that need to be protected and respected both by the state themselves and by the international community uh, on the whole. So it's really out of these two competing philosophies that responsibility to protect emerges. Um, how you reconcile international law with responsibility to protect is where it becomes immensely tricky. Um, as has been mentioned, um, RTP emerged out of um, discussions uh, with the 
International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty in response to a question that was posed by Kofi Annan. And he said, if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that affect every precept of our common humanity? So it was an idea of, well, how do we, how do we call humanitarian intervention, uh, humanitarian intervention by any other name, just not the one that's going to raise all the hackles of, of non-interventionist states? And as, as Bob mentioned, the ICISS came up with this idea that um, states have a responsibility to protect their own people, but where a state is unable or unwilling to do so, that responsibility then kind of devolves to the international community. It's their responsibility to step up and take over. I first learned about the idea of responsibility to protect when I was doing international law as a student in 2001. And at the time when it was being talked about, it was incredibly new, and no one really had any belief that this was actually going to be taken up in any kind of way. It was seen as being pie in the sky, just kind of fantastic tree-hugging, you know, you know, whinging, lefty, greeny, whatever you want to call it, um, idea about can't we all just get along, but that if it was going to gain any kind of traction, it would mean that everyone collectively had to have an aneurysm. Uh, ironically, um, that wasn't the case. It got picked up by the UN very, very quickly. Uh, it got talked about a lot in the UN and in the General Assembly. Uh, it was promoted very heavily by diplomats, by some <coughs> lawyers and practitioners, by non-governmental organisations. And so it really gets to the point where it becomes now just part of the kind of default discourse. To the point that when um, the UN did authorise involvement, uh, albeit limited involvement, um, and intervention in Libya last year, Resolution 1973, which authorised military intervention, um, stated, uh, reiterating the responsibility of the Libyan authorities to protect the Libyan pe uh, population and reaffirming that parties to armed conflicts bear the primary responsibility to take all feasible steps to ensure the protection of civilians. So you really see the, the terminology of R2P suddenly come into, into fore in terms of binding Security Council resolutions. Despite the seeming acceptance of R2P, it is almost impossible to say that it's got any kind of legal force. Um, David Harris, who's an international law expert, has said it would seem that the responsibility to protect involves a political rather than a legal undertaking and does not involve any kind of new customary international law norm. And Gillian Triggs, who is the Dean of, of Sydney Law School and the Charles Professor of International Law, has stated that RTP is a creative approach to the need to protect those at risk of significant human rights abuses and one that avoids the difficulties inherent in the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. But while there is a growing political commitment to the principle of the responsibility to protect, it does not yet have the status of custom, nor is it articulated in treaty form. So these are really two kind of fundamental failings with regards to RTP, as much as it's talked about as a, as a doctrine. It's a political doctrine, it's not a legal doctrine. And as, as Bob alluded to, the incredibly kind of spotty application of R2P um, demonstrates its limitations. It was used in, in Libya, but there's been no such kind of talk with regards to Syria. The fact that both China and, and Russia have been able to veto any action without any kind of consequences apart from people saying uh, bad Russia uh, really kind of demonstrates the limitations that this is a legal concept. Um, another fair critique of RTP has been that as it's been kind of taken up by the UN, it's not really saying anything new. Um, if you look at the ICISS um, document, it says that force should be used only as a very last resort, and that there is no better or more appropriate body than the United Nations Security Council to authorise military intervention for human protection purposes. Well, if you look at the UN Charter, that's precisely what the Charter authorises the Security Council to do anyway. Um, under Chapter 6 on the Peaceful Settlement of Disputes, the Charter requires states to engage in disputes to pursue all peaceful means such as negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements, or any other peaceful means of their own choice. Only if such methods fail are states entitled to then take that dispute to the Security Council, who are then the right authority basically to authorise any kind of action that can be taken by air, sea or land forces, if necessary, to maintain or restore international peace and security. So if we're saying that R2P basically authorises the UN Security Council to um, allow for, on a case-by-case -case basis, military intervention, 
That's something the Charter already authorises the Security Council to do. So it seems a bit redundant to be promoting this new doctrine that has essentially been a, a rewording of what the, the Charter has been able to do anyway. And ultimately, to quote RTP expert Anne Orford, who's a, a professor at Melbourne, she says that what RTP does is not so much create rights or impose legal obligations, but can be understood as conferring public power and allocating jurisdiction. Thus, the term responsibility to protect is not so much an invocation of responsibility as we would understand it as a, an invocation of a legal responsibility, but rather really it, it derives its power as a rhetorical tool. It would appear that R2P gets around some of these problems by designating the so-called crimes which justify intervention. And what Colin is talking about in the view of many people uh, would not fall under one of these headings. So others of a more cynical nature might say, well, here's a uh, an appalling thing happening in some other country, but this grand new doctrine doesn't seem to cover it. There was a similar example uh, in the last couple of years, I can't quite remember the year, there were floods or cyclones in Myanmar, and uh, it was alleged that the government had responded very, very poorly to that. And the consequence was, mass suffering on behalf of people <coughs> in that country. And the question was raised, well, why doesn't the international community intervene? Now, it's doubtful, given these particular criteria, uh, that the, there would be any basis uh, for intervention. Uh, it all points to the immense difficulty in establishing <coughs> generally accepted grounds for intervention. And I guess this is one of the problems you inevitably uh, come up against uh, when you try to uh, approach a problem in this particular way. In answer to uh, Colin's question, I suspect nothing will be done for these poor unfortunates. If the state consents, it's not intervention. It, in, international law is pretty straightforward about that. So if the situation were to occur um, uh, in Greece where you suddenly just found that um, the, the refugees were being harassed by, by ultra-right-wing movements, which is certainly a possibility in Greece at the moment, or if there was a, you know, uh, suddenly, you know, mass food shortages or little things like that, all that Greece would have to do is ask for help. And it would be up to the international community, as many states or as few states as wanted to, to send uh, whatever aid they wanted to. And you wouldn't need to worry about appealing to uh, an exception to the use of force because there is no force involved, you wouldn't need to worry about it being some kind of intervention because essentially all it would be is, is um, a, a, a slightly more over-enthusiastic form of international aid. It would be kind of an ad hoc international aid. So it wouldn't necessarily um, trigger these kinds of situations. The problem, of course, as happened with, with Myanmar, was that they didn't want any help uh, and specifically refused repeated requests by a, a number of states can we help you, what can we do? Their, their concerns were, well, the moment we start letting foreign aid um, into the country and certainly uh, foreign agents into the country, how are we going to get them out? And, and are they going to start inter interfering in the political systems or any kind of other systems? Are, they, mm -hmm. are we going to be able to say to them, okay, well, you've, you've rebuilt the village and you've helped us, you can leave now? Because in a lot of these kinds of situations, um, once you go in to try and rebuild after a major catastrophe, it can take years to do so. And so you can understand concerns about um, uh, people coming in and not leaving. By coincidence, I was talking to a very distinguished American journalist today, Robert Kaplan, about this very issue. And he said, well, the trouble is, you know, in an election year, First of all, the Americans have got no appetite to intervene in Syria uh, at the moment because um, they've had enough of wars in the Middle East. And, and secondly, um, even if they were to interfere, they have no idea what the outcome was. And they went into Iraq and, okay, they managed to get rid of Saddam Hussein but created an immense humanitarian problem. These are his words, not mine. 
um, after that, which uh, is still there and, still, and people are still trying to mop up. So there really is no appetite for that. And um, if I were a cynic, which I probably am, if I were a cynic, I would suggest that the Americans are rather pleased that the, Ameri that the Russians and the Chinese have vetoed any direct military action because it gives them the excuse of not doing it. One of the real problems with international law, um, as with many areas of law, uh, is that it can be interpreted in a number of ways and it can be used to um, argue a number of positions. And if you remember back to what happened when um, the Americans first proposed going into Iraq, uh, about a number of, I think it would have been about 50 or so Australian international lawyers wrote an open letter, which got published in, I think it was The Australian, in which they said this war is illegal and they listed all the reasons why it was. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there were an equal number of international lawyers in Australia, good ones from good universities, ones who actually you know, didn't buy their degrees on the internet, who said this war is legal. <laughs> and these are the reasons why. Now, both of them had access to the same um, information dossiers. No one was privy to information that the other one wasn't. But they both managed to come up with equally coherent and equally persuasive arguments for both sides. And that is part of the problem with international law um, and the fact that you are trying to apply what is ostensibly meant to be an objective principle to changing fact scenarios. And everyone gets up in arms about the, uh, about the Iraq war, oh, there were no weapons of mass destruction. Well, at the time, there was reasonable grounds to believe that they were, or certainly a number of people really felt that. And there were plenty of people who believed that that was actually all a lie. And so, it, is the problem about trying to sort of apply objective standards to occasionally subjective information. So I, I understand your frustrations with international law. It, it certainly is, uh, is both its, its limitations and its, uh, and its promise. There have been norms that have become established, as you say, anti-colonialism mm -hmm. is one. Opposition to slavery is another. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty is probably the most um, obvious one. Some people question whether opposition to the spread of nuclear weapons is also becoming a norm. And it's in that context that you have to ask yourself, is the idea of intervening to protect the human rights of people uh, also uh, becoming a norm. Um, I guess from what I've said earlier, I'd at the very least say that the jury is uh, still out on this. But the fact that other norms have been established uh, in international relations suggests that um, this could possibly occur. It all depends on the extent to which it's picked up. And that's why activists are also always attracted <coughs> by this sort of challenge. And they would argue, well, the more that we activate, the more pressure we bring to bear on governments, the more likely those governments are to pick up on this. And it's a reciprocal process. Um, the more governments pick up on an, on an idea, the more it circulates in the international community, and the more likely it is that activists within particular states will be influenced and uh, supported by that circulating idea. This is the business of norm generations, the generation of people who write about this, even talk about norm entrepreneurs, for instance, and the way on, and they liken it to the way entrepreneurs go about entrepreneurial uh, activity. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I, you obviously can't say at the moment, but from what um, has been said, earlier, the legal status of this idea is on pretty thin ice. It's not become custom, and it's certainly not treaty law. And um, the sorts of things that I'm talking about do tend to have those characteristics. So it's a big ask. International law in this respect is, is like any branch of law, which is it's always a somewhat reactive law. It, it is responding to uh, something happens, enough people go, that doesn't seem right. 
and then you either get legislators or with international or you get states coming together go okay well how do we deal with that so I, I, I think that you can look at the the history of international law as being a, a series of responses to major events that are, are considered problematic um, there are of course many other issues with regards to the perennial debate about victor's justice and things like that it's always about whoever is in the position to actually make the call about it being wrong um, but I, I think that with regards to RTV, it, it really is still very much, it's still too early to actually say that this is forming any kind of, um, any kind of law that can be enforced. Uh, it's something that's really going to have to, to play out over years because it is unfortunately the case of the international legal system that um, the most development, certainly when you're looking at the kind of big picture stuff, you either have to have a massive catastrophe of a World War II type um, the Genocide Convention would not exist were it not for the Holocaust. Um, and no one really wants to have to have a massive catastrophe in order to then finally have a piece of law that deals with it. Um, or you have it develop um, from custom, which tends to take a lot longer because it's about having enough state practice and then having enough states acting in a certain way because they believe they probably should for it to then become a customary norm. And then even then, you have to have enough people saying, oh, that it's a customary norm for it to be. Well, it, it only points up what the argument I made, that interests are still very much at uh, the centre in all of this. South Africa, in its attitude to intervention, tends to reflect the views of most of the members of the Organisation of African Unity, that is, the collective body of African states. They generally are opposed to the idea of intervention because they realise what a minefield uh, they're entering into. Most of those countries have their borders drawn by colonial powers and those borders take no account of ethnic differences and so the potential for conflict within most of the states of Africa is very great. So generally it's been a hands-off attitude when it comes to intervention. But that's South Africa's interest and the interest of most of the leaderships of the African states. Um, the other Commonwealth allies, uh, particularly countries like Britain, have an interest in supporting South Africa. South Africa is seen as some sort of quasi-ally or at least a very powerful entity in that part of the world. And um, the British have a, a long history of, uh, of supporting South Africa, just like the Russians support Serbia and the Americans support Israel. All of the states have, have interests. It's very difficult to get around it. And this is why it's so quintessentially uh, a, political, uh, a political issue.